welcome to uh, the Edward Hutchinson podcast. This is actually the sixth ever episode that we've done of this, and I'm quite excited because today we are joined by Mr. David Parnes. Ed, thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. I feel I feel honoured. Absolutely. Well, I, I think Fellow we feel a little more honoured. Yeah, and that's actually the one thing I was really excited about was uh, I actually remember when I first moved out here and I started selling property. I bumped into I actually went to one of your listings right. uh, on St Ives Drive. Bumped into James. Yes, I know the one. Yeah. We had two up there, actually. You had two up yeah, there. Yeah. It was, I think, listed at the time at 15 million. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it was 17,995, 17, if I'm not mistaken. We ended up selling for 15.4. That was a great house. Really? Our client, yeah. Evan Gaskin, one of our clients, great builder, puts his heart and soul literally into his projects. Really? That was a great one, and at the time, you know, two thousand dollars a foot was a good price. And that was it, because I think that was. Um, I'm trying to think back when we first started, two thousand and eight, end of two thousand and fifteen, I think was. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, so I kind of bumped into these guys, and if you if you don't recognise the name David Parnes, you probably should do if you're into real estate and you follow our content. But he's actually one of the. Um, I called you a character actually the other day, but I feel that's a bit weird because it is you're playing yourself, not someone else. Yes. So therefore, you're one of the stars of Million Dollar Listing LA. I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. And so, thank you so much for joining us today. Because um, actually, me. yeah, because I think we visited one of your open houses a couple of weeks ago, and it was really good just to chat to you. Yes, um, I'm quite excited because I'm hoping that we're going to do some collaboration soon. But actually, yeah. I think there are so many people that are listening out there right now. And actually, I found that out because I sent out a message on our Instagram yesterday and asked if anyone wanted to ask you questions, and we got quite a few through. Um, so David, really? thank you. Yeah, we did. We did. So get ready to listen to these questions. Okay. Um, okay, David. So uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, I wanted to actually just get a bit of background about you. Firstly, right. obviously you're from England. I am from London. London. Yeah. Okay. London, England. London, England. Because a lot of people uh, that I know in England move to London. It's quite like that LA vibe of the UK kind of thing, where people move there from everywhere in the UK. Right. And you get a lot of people that did actually were born and grew up in London. However, there's a huge amount of people that didn't. So you actually grew up there. I actually grew up in London. Yeah, no, I did. I was born and raised. And um, I lived there till I was 26 years old. And that was until, I can tell you exactly, it was January 2009. Okay. And jumped on a plane to LA and never ever went back. Well, I visited, but never moved back. And what was the reason that you actually got on the plane? Well, I mean, at the time, I had been doing commercial real estate, actually, in, in Europe. That was actually one of my questions, so that's a very good... Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Answer answer already. There you go. <laughs> Beating me to it. Uh, but no, it was, it was commercial real estate. It was just before the credit crisis. Yeah. And what happened was we were buying a portfolio of, of um, retail properties okay. in Germany and Poland. Yeah. And... Lo and behold, the credit crisis took effect. The banks folded. Like you don't expect the bank that's lending you the money to fold. You know, it's, it's normally like the, the, the buyer that, that, yeah. that goes bankrupt. But anyway, the banks folded and obviously, you know, everything went bad. So I was out of a job. So it wasn't the same situation that we saw in the US where they were kind of bailing out the banks. They actually let the banks fold or... Yes, exactly. Because a lot of it, it, it really was a little bit more um, complex when it came to the commercial real estate as well. Because what happened was initially the person that loans you the money mm -hmm. sells that loan in batches to yeah. another bank, right? Which was the issue in 2008. Wasn't right. It? Now, when you have a commitment from one of those banks that are going to lend you when you buy a property... Mm -hmm. um, that is the original lender, okay? They went BK, so they can't honour their obligations. Does that make sense? So yeah. the banks that got bailed out were maybe um, the second or third banks that had bought all these loans off of the first banks okay, because then it's too big to fail, quite literally. Do you see what I mean? These I little see, ones can fail, the big ones can't. So yeah, it was a disaster. <laughs> so what was that? I'm glad it happened when I was young. Because actually, that's a weird thing for me because I sold property in London, as, as many people listening know, for four and a half years before I moved over here, but I was yeah. more on the residential side. But I missed the crash. Right. So it was kind of when I got Lucky into... You. Yeah. <laughs> I, and everyone I was kind of chatting to, they were like, oh, you know, the market's coming back now and it's a bit of a different situation. And obviously, I expect that I will see that in my career. So it's quite good to kind of get the insight. Did you actually just wake up one morning, saw the press and were like, what are we going to do? Or? You kind of start to feel it before it happens. Okay. So basically... Uh, it was funny, actually, because if I take a step back from there, like even before that, when I left university, I went to work for a hedge fund. I worked for free because I couldn't 
really get a paid job there. My, my, my grades weren't quite good enough. Okay. Um, so I said, I'll, I, I'll start as an intern. I, I did one month for free and then I did two months for free. And then they put me on a very small salary for the rest of the year. And it gave me an incredible experience because what I was doing without realizing it was this hedge fund actually was one of the managing vehicles that bought all this toxic debt. I didn't realize it was even toxic. So I was getting a perspective as I was learning for the first time yeah. of the credit crisis happening, believe it or not. And was there any red flags going off in your head? No, like because at the time it was all bullish. It was like, oh, we've got to buy this one. We've got to buy this batch. They're all asset backed securities. So you're buying yeah. all these, these different levels of debt. Do you know what I mean? Whether commercial mortgage backed securities, residential mortgage backed securities, aircraft leases, all anything that pays, you know, um, in instalments, so to speak, like mortgages do. Yeah. They buy all of it. So at that time, it was like, let's buy it all, which was great because business was booming. But what they didn't realize is it gets a little bit complex, but the way that these things were packaged together, they're just loans that are packaged together, yeah. was very toxic. And yeah. that's obviously... And misleading in terms of the actual quality of... Right. Them. They're just repackaging. They're getting a bunch of crappy loans, quite literally, right? Yeah. And they're packaging them together. Yeah. And then they're saying, you can buy the senior debt part of this, or the junior debt part of this. Now, really, it's all not very good anyway. Yeah. But the way they packaged it, then they re-rate them, and it's honestly it goes on a little bit. But what I what I saw was the the reason the credit crisis happened without seeing without realizing it. So as my first job, that was probably the best experience ever. Yeah. But then I didn't realize, so I went on to buy. I went on for you know from there to buy these commercial assets on behalf of a investor, and that all went wrong. That's when the credit crisis hit. So that experience, I wouldn't, it was, don't get me wrong, it was really stressful and it was not very pleasant, but I wouldn't change it for the world because that has given me such an eye opener. Yeah. It's given me so much perspective and experience and I'm just grateful it happened when I was starting off in my career rather than halfway through or at the end because frankly I was young and there could have been a lot more damage 100%. to be done personally than there was. Because now, yeah, you're a married man now with a, with a kid. Yeah, I've got huge responsibilities <laughs> now. Yeah, so I suppose actually if you're kind of banking on making that certain amount of money per year, yeah. kind of that security, that could have been a really kind of... Well, I mean, it's, you know, when you're, when you're, I mean, it started when I was probably about 23 to about 26, just before I moved here. Yeah, I didn't have responsibilities. I could, I could, you know, just get up, brush myself off, yeah. jump on a plane and then come to Los Angeles and start fresh, which I did. And so what was, was there any reason that it was Los Angeles that you chose or, and how did you kind of do that with Visa? Because I get that constantly from a lot of yeah, our English watchers. You can always kind of, um, you can always, I, I always used to come on vacation to LA. Yeah. Loved it here. My sister actually um, went to acting school here. So she was always here as well. James was here as well. He'd moved a few years before. Um, and it was just kind of like a, I had nothing to lose basically. Yeah. And I loved LA. So I came here, got sponsored obviously. And then basically just started trading commodities for a bit, and then James and I started off our company. And it was like, honestly, it was almost a shot for nothing. We didn't really know LA real estate. You don't yeah. know it until you really get stuck in. I didn't grow up here. So, um, you know, everything was learned from scratch, but, you know, I've always loved real estate, okay. and I've actually always loved residential real estate. I've always loved houses since I was a kid. I'd, I'd walk around with my parents and just go and look at the houses that they were building. They've always built houses as well. And I'd just be obsessed with all the details at like eight years old, like yeah. unhealthily um, obsessed, like with the baseboard and the crown moldings yeah. and yeah, even the light switches and the dimmers, just everything. I was, I've always been infatuated by it. That's awesome. So for me, it was just to be in real estate, especially residential was great. I mean, this is a dream come true for me. Do something that you love, I suppose to. Well, yeah. I suppose, how, how did you find that? Because I suppose when we talk to the commercial guys in our office here, a lot yeah. of it is we're behind the desk, we're making cold calls, we're looking at spreadsheets. It's right. all about the returns. It's not. And I feel like in the residential space, we have a bit more of that. Like we're a therapist half the time. We're almost holding someone's hand through a very stressful process. Yeah, a lot of the time that is the case for sure. Do you I enjoy mean, that side of it as well? Yeah, I mean, what I really love is is I, I love doing all deals. I love solving problems. You yeah. know, the bigger the problem, the more fun it is to get that solution, and the more challenging it is to get that deal closed. I love that. So you just give me the the most difficult situation, and I do find the most complex deals are the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, everyone says, okay, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's just you, a transaction. You get, yeah, you get paid and they're all the same. Yes, to a degree, because the principle's the same, but I find the larger the transaction, the more complex 
the whole transaction becomes yeah. because you're going to have an army of attorneys on each side. You're going to have a much bigger property to deal with and there's more, there's bigger stakes involved, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked on, you know, a $70 million deal, for example, and it took me a year to close that. Really? That's every day for a year. You're like literally just not all day, every day, but a lot of the time, like at least an hour, two hours a day for a year. And that was just constantly solving the problems with, with working as a team with, you know, the buyer, the seller side and, and the agents and attorneys and just really making it happen. But you know what? It's that much more rewarding when it, when it closes, yeah. you know? Because I suppose actually the build up for most people, they're like, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm banking my hours right now. I'm doing two hours a day and I get paid a hundred bucks an hour to work. Whereas in our profession, yeah. there is no commission until the deal's closed. So yeah, I suppose well, yeah. that gives you just an insane reward after a whole year of that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I've never really been salaried before. Yeah. So this is all I really know. Yeah, okay. And, you know, I shared on my Instagram yesterday, actually, I did a video because I was thinking about it. And when I first did, got my first sales job, I was horrendous. Yeah. Like, I am not a natural salesperson. I'm really not. Really? No, 100% not. Because I remember I had this job, it was selling advertising space over the phone, right? When I, when, just before it was like my gap year, you know, yeah. in between like university and like when you finish school. Cold calling. Yeah, my brother was there. He got me the job um, and he was like a rock star. Yeah. He was like, you know, famous in that room. And he had, you know, he was, at the time he was like, you know, in his teens, right? But he was driving around his BMW convertible, like, you know, baller, right? And I was just like... I want a bit of that. How do I do that? And they were all expecting me to be so great because my brother was so good. And I went in. I was horrendous. I couldn't sell. They demoted me to the crappy office down the street. Really? And I just kept going, though. I just kept going. I just didn't give up. I just had faith. And it took months and months and months and months, which in a, you know, a job over the phone, selling over the phone is a long time because they expect you just to hit your first deal straight away. And eventually, it just kind of stuck. I just, You just have to go and, and a lot of people say to me you know it's not going very well for me yeah um i just kind of want to give up now and find something else to do my answer to that actually is no what you're doing is you are building up a pipeline yeah. without realizing it right you know they always say success without getting too philosophical but success is failure to turn inside out right what we perceive to be a failure right now yeah. is probably going to be a much bigger success than we could ever imagine if we stay on course yeah. and if we don't give up and from that first sales job i learned that i don't give up mm -hmm. and even if it seems like everything's going wrong and this deal's falling through and i haven't got you know even today if i haven't got an escrow or something i do know that i just keep focused yeah i go through the motions as far as you know showing up and 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 you know going to listing meetings and you know pitching and working just going through everything i would normally do mm -hmm. and Ultimately, it will come together yeah. because it's a proven industry we're in. Yeah. You know, people sell real estate everywhere. Definitely. And I just believe in any sales job, not giving up. And you don't have to be a natural in it either. You just have to learn your craft. If you're not a natural, you might just have to work a little bit harder yeah. or a lot harder in order to hit that wave. But you will hit it if you don't give up. So it was you were making cold calls. Uh, but that, I think, is the thing, isn't it? It's almost... You're teaching yourself a skill because I did the same thing at kind of Foxton's and I'm sure it wasn't maybe nearly the same level of calls that you were putting out. But it was like you're supposed to do 100 outbound phone calls per day and it's all registered on the system. And every day you should do that. And when you first start out and people are just hanging up on you yeah. and saying, like, what the hell? It you kind of take it in you as if it's an uh, insult to you. you that's know, another thing. personal thing. Yeah, you can't. That's such a good point you raised. Yeah. You can't take it personally. Yeah. You've got it. You're going to hear in sales. You're going to hear you know, 20 no's before you hear a yes, typically. Yeah. And that's just part of the game. You've got to just let it roll off your, your shoulder and not, not let it get to you. Because yeah. the moment, you know, the emotions come in, then the self-doubt comes in. And yeah. then, you know, I can't comes in. The negatives come in. And the reality is, you know, that's just going to distract us yeah. from doing our job. Yeah. We need to stay as focused as possible. And it's not always easy because, you know, there are pressures in life. And Hearing no's all the time, you know, can get the better of you. But it happens for everyone. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. But I maintain that if you if you don't give up and, and you remain focused and, and go through the motions that you're meant to go through and, and keep that optimism, just keep that belief that right now it might not be happening, but it will work out in the future. Yeah. It will work out. Yeah. And I maintain that. I really believe that. So it's always it's it's having the goal of what you're trying to achieve in, in your mindset. Yes. And doing everything in terms of those daily steps to get there and not giving up on it. Exactly. Yeah. Doing. You yeah. know, it's you just got to go through the motions. You have to do what's needed to be done, whether you want to do it or not, yeah. whether you believe that it's gonna work out or not, 
it has to be, you know, it needs to be done in order to get to that point. Because if you don't do that, you're definitely not yeah. going to get a close. I think that is the thing. And I suppose you probably get that a huge amount of people watching the show where they're like, oh, look at this lucky guy. You know, he gets to walk around and see incredibly expensive mansions. And they'd love to put the number, I know, in mm -hmm. terms of what the commission could be on that. Yeah. Which people are like, oh, my God, like, look, he's just basically shown a house and made that much money. What they don't get to see is the years of work of you building your network, your relationships, mm. the processes to actually get that deal done, like you're talking about with that year. It's just, honestly, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's not always up, but the reality is that, you know, it's not easy because frankly, being a real estate agent, yeah. as we all know, someone can go get their license and become a realtor. Yeah. It's not like you need tons of money. Yes, I had to work two jobs at the beginning because I wouldn't be able to support myself otherwise. Really? Yeah, of course. But, you know, the point is, it's not, there's no high barriers to entry, which basically means because there's no high barriers to entry, it's far more competitive yeah. and cutthroat typically. Definitely. So you just have to work that much harder than everyone else mm -hmm. in order to make it happen and really believe and learn your craft. And we always at the beginning door knocked. That's what we did. Really? Yeah, we did. We door knocked. And I've spoken about this before. We, we, we would literally pay rock, scissors, paper with door knock houses and look for teardowns. So you guys would walk down the street, play rock, paper rocks. We'd whatever, be in the car, yeah. we'd take turns. But the truth is, honestly, you know, the biggest dilemma for me anyway, yeah. when I was when I first became a realtor, it was like, okay, well, what do I do right now? Because how do we get listings yeah. if we don't have a track record? But then if you don't, how do you get a track record if you don't have listings? It's the most chicken and egg situation yeah. you can yeah. get. Catch 22. So it's like, how does this work? Yeah. And the beginning is always the hardest in any business anyway. So that's what we realized. It was like, okay, what's going on in this market right now? And we noticed that a lot of teardowns were happening. There were a lot of developers looking to buy houses, tear them down and maximize the lot, Yeah. which which wasn't as common then. So there were a lot of lots available. Whereas now, because, well, now they're all saturated. Yeah, it's insane. But at the time, what we would do is we would door knock, mm -hmm. we would find a lot and we would offer it to a developer because a developer, if you offer them a good deal, they're going to buy it. Yeah. You don't need a relationship with them because they're going to size up the deal themselves. Definitely. And if you do a good job and you maintain that relationship with them, the chances are they'll give you the listing on the back end. Yeah. So basically what we've managed to do is sell these teardowns and we mainly did it in Bel Air. We didn't start like low. We really? were selling like six to ten million dollar teardowns. How do you door knock in Bel Air with you just, the gates and things? You, just, you, just do, you the ring the bell, bell. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You ring the doorbell yeah. and just hope for the best, basically. Security don't come out. Yeah. Well, right? <laughs> sometimes they did. And yeah. I mentioned we'd, we'd door knock Dr. Dre's house when he was on Oriel. Um, really? Way in, in the Bird Streets. and his Didn't that house sell? Was that on the market It sold, yeah. When it yeah. was his. When it was his. And I was like petrified because I just lost that rock scissors paper game. Oh, so it was no. me. I was standing there. I was like, oh, God, here we go. And no, he, he the security came out. He goes, he's not selling. At the time, maybe he wasn't. And that was the end of it. Really? Yeah. Then we went to Leo's house down the street. So <laughs> Only crazy. in LA, right? Yeah. That is, that is one thing I do realise is that it becomes a little bit normalised. Yeah. Where you see, like... Because in London and England, where you're growing up, you see a celebrity and it's kind of like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Whereas because this is the home of that mass market for very, you know, feature films and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's actually, people are here professionally to do that. Yeah. So it's almost like seeing, you know, the banker who's incredibly successful at what he does, except it's the actor doing the same thing. A hundred percent. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the truth is that they're still normal people. You know what I mean? They're yeah. just, as you said, they're doing their job and they happen to be have a presence publicly on, yeah. on TV typically. Um, but, you know, what we noticed is that, you know, we, it was like, why not go for the big ones straight yeah. away? Because the principle's exactly the same. You know, you can sell a $1 million teardown or a $6 million teardown or a $10 million teardown. It's just a number. So we went for the big league straight away and we were selling six to $10 million teardowns and then relisting them. And that's how we've managed to accumulate at this point mm -hmm. a you know, over a billion dollars worth of listings, which are, a lot of them are under construction right now. Yeah. So um, do you ever, you guys sell stuff that is, because I'm sure that's something that a lot of people think about because they see obviously on the show, mm. you want to see the most wow properties there because that's what people are entertained by. Mm. Do you guys sell a lot that's kind of below that, you know, yeah, um, still a million dollars? I say that and everyone's out there is thinking a million dollars is still an insane amount of money. It is an insane it is, amount yeah. of money. Absolutely. We, we will sell anything from a million dollars to $200 million, you know. Yeah. But the point is that, you know, it's important to 
sell all levels of real estate because it's not every day you're going to pop a $50 million deal or yeah. a, a, even a $15 million deal. So it's very important whether you know, you're selling these big properties still to, to, to focus on the smaller ones as well because they are the bread and butter. You know? yeah. They're going to pay your bills in the meantime. And I suppose, yeah, that's exactly the thing. When you, if you saw an economic downturn of like the 2008 situation, people yeah. still need to live somewhere exactly. and move you know, from their own life effects and what's going on with them. Whereas the people buying the 15 mil can probably afford to hold off for a couple of years. So it There's far more buyers at the two to three to four, even five million dollar level yeah. than there are at the 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar level. Yeah. And that means that you're going to do more of those deals. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Than, yeah. than the big ones. It's just a numbers game at the end of the day. So yeah, absolutely. We do all, all, all the full range. So here's a really good question that you may have gone through before in the past and it may be out there, but how did you and James meet? Oh, right. Okay. So James and I... We grew up together. Our mums were best friends. So both in London. Both in London. We knew each other from day one. It wasn't like you were going to school together. It was like family friends kind of situation. Yeah, our mums were best friends. That's so cool. Yeah. And so when did James head out here? And, and were you kind of coming out here and seeing him? And he was here full time when you moved out? He was He was out here. I come out for summers. He was here for, about, I think, about three years before me or four years before me, something like that. Wow, okay. um, so he was out here already. Yeah, no, I come and visit and we party and go crazy. Yeah. That's how we were. Um, and then, yeah, when I moved out here, we kind of got serious and really, you know, set up the company and, and never looked back. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. So how often do you guys go back to the UK or is that? Honestly, the truth is, you know, if, if I'm going with my wife in the summer, for example, and we go to Europe, that's yeah. what we like to do. Okay. Um, we will stop off in London, either on the way yeah. or the way back. Okay. You know, say hi and, and, and that's it. But it's, it's funny because... That's not my home. LA is absolutely my home. And I'll tell you how I know this then. Because when I was a kid and I used to go away um, on vacation, right? Yeah. I'd always be like, okay, time to go back to London now, which was home. Yeah. If I go to London, I'm like, okay, time to go back to LA now, yeah. which is home. I know that this is my home for that reason, you know, and I love it here. I mean, it's, come on, it's, it's, it's a beautiful it way amazing. of life. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I, and actually, it's funny you say that because it's been the last couple of times that I've flown back to London where it's been that switch. Because originally, you know, when you first move out here, you're like, oh, that we do things differently in London. Like, oh, we don't have stop signs. We do traffic lights. And this is how we do it. My brain is now shifted to that when I'm going back to London, I'm driving down the streets. I'm like, <laughs> oh, didn't we? Do they always do that? You know, like it's strange, that, isn't it? Yeah, my yeah. normal is now LA. I'm a horrendous driver anyway, so the truth <laughs> is, whether I'm driving in LA or London, yeah. it's not probably going to end very well. <laughs> I didn't think I was that bad, but everyone says I'm the worst driver. Really? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, apparently I'm terrible. Well, that's good to know if we go and like tour some properties. Together. You're going to drive. We're going to drive. <laughs> yeah, my wife doesn't even let me drive when she's in the car. She really? drives. Yeah, it's like the opposite situation with me and my wife. I'm like, can you please, babe, just. Uh, Give me the keys because I do not want to be. Oh, really? Are you serious? Yeah. That is she's, hysterical. She's just so aggressive, and I don't know whether it's her, like, growing up, but she does. She just pushes her way to the front of everything, and it stresses me out massively. Oh, that so, is brilliant. That's another thing that I find really weird: is how many people in LA complain about LA traffic? Are yeah, they have no London? idea. Oh my god, they have no idea. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, this is perfect. It is amazing, isn't yeah, it? And nothing wrong with LA traffic, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I suppose we don't have the tube here but that's actually soon to change or you know apparently so yeah but you know what the reality is even if you're in traffic in LA even yeah. if you're sitting in your car in traffic the sun shining yeah. except for today yeah, exactly <laughs> you know what like I mean it's like it's sun. not you know the sun shining the sky's blue it's like you know everything seems more spaced out and relaxed so yeah. it's, it's even being in a traffic jam it just doesn't feel like a London traffic jam yeah. do you know what I mean no definitely I uh, 100% agree okay so um, I want to give some value out there to the audience as much as possible and I think a lot of people out there are thinking you know I want to get into real estate or I look at what David's doing and actually I'd love to see myself there in a few years. Um, are there any kind of things, because we talked about actually what you've learned from your banking career and that kind of, sorry, the investment career mm -hmm. and that side of it. Are there, is there any, any big regrets or big lessons that you learned early days in your career that you now look back on and you're like... I'm glad that happened, but actually it was it was a bad situation. But I think what we yeah what we spoke about as far as you know when I was buying that commercial real estate and yeah. the credit crisis happened, it all went wrong. It's kind of like I would probably say that you know in hindsight I don't regret anything because it's all part of the experience mm -hmm. and the learning curve. Okay. Um, without failures, we're never going to get experience and learn. Definitely. It's just so I, I have no regrets about that. But what I would say is, I don't rush things like I used to. I don't want to run before I can walk, okay? So what I'm saying is, you know, 
it's not necessary in your first or second year to sell 100 million or 200 million or or build the best real estate and build a 20 million dollar house and get all these backers and funding and god knows what yeah. i think sometimes you know it's it's better to take your time okay you know that's the only thing i can think of i was like i want to i want to be successful now i want to be successful today yeah doesn't work like that because the beginning is the foundation and you need to build a strong foundation because you can be a one hit wonder and then it can collapse as quickly as it's built. But if it's built over time, it's yeah. going to be a stronger foundation. It's going to be more difficult for that to crumble. Does that make sense? 100%. So I think just not rush, stay in the moment. And, and you know, from my experience, just, and I, I should actually listen to myself say this because sometimes I, I go off track, but you know, have patience. Yeah. You know, I need to focus on my patience as well Definitely. because, you know, sometimes things don't need to happen when I want them to happen. Yeah. Sometimes the results can be better if I let go to a degree mm -hmm. and be patient and wait for the outcome yeah. because there's only so much we have control over. You know what I mean? We don't want to start controlling the stuff we don't have control over because that's when it starts to get messy. So I think differentiating between that and, and learning to let go and be patient is hugely important. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Because actually that's weird because that just pinged something in my head. Mm -hmm. When I first started working and selling property in London, when we used to make those calls, mm -hmm. they used to say, you need to be listening 80% of the time and speaking 20% of the time. That's great. Because a huge amount of people, I think, go on the phone and they're like, oh, it's an amazing property. Da, 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 you know who da. tells me that? Mauricio. Mauricio. Really? I, he's, he's a, I look up to Mauricio a lot. Yeah. Like I, I, I credit so much of anything I've achieved in real estate to Mauricio. Really? 100%. We do a lot together and, and he gives me great advice. Um, but he does say, you know, listen. Yeah. You know, you don't always need to be talking. Yeah. If you slow down and listen, you're going to hear from the client what they're asking. Definitely. Because sometimes you can talk over that and miss the point completely. 100%. So that, that's actually a great point you just said. In, in my opinion. I think it, it always boils down to me is like assumption is kind of like the mother of all fuck ups in a way. Yeah. And it's almost like Did I you used to swear. Yeah. So, <laughs> you occasionally swear we do swear. On live yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but kidding. it is a bit of a weird one because I used to walk into showings and I've stopped this doing it now, but especially when we were in the UK, because it's a bit of a different model where actually you're representing the seller, mm -hmm. trying to pull as many buyers as you're in, and there's not a side to each transaction. Right. So I would walk into a property and I'd be like, look, this is overpriced because I know about this in the office and all of the feedback that I've had from other people is, mm -hmm. God, look at that mold in that bedroom. Mm -hmm. When I used to walk in and go, oh, you know, don't worry about the mold in the bedroom. It's an awful thing, but it's fine. That used to like cause things in their head. If I didn't say anything, mm -hmm. people would be like, oh, you know what, there's mould there, but we know that, da, da, da. And it would almost, it wouldn't cause, everyone adapts in their own way and sees it from their own perspective. And mm -hmm. the le least that you can try and influence that way mm -hmm. and be patient, stand back and let them kind of make their own thoughts and then react mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, I mean, I get your point as far as like the mould thing goes, but look, as far as, you know, anything yeah, like that, really <laughs> you, you absolutely, no, you absolutely want to disclose it and make it yeah. very clear that that's there. You know, our, our industry, and, and it should be about disclosure. Yeah disclose everything but the point is that you know i've noticed that the more i talk the less i hear 100%. and i think your point back to your point it's hugely important to for us to be able to listen because we'll be able to give the right answers not the wrong answers otherwise. yeah 100 percent. because we're there to serve people at the end of the day you yeah know, we want to make sure we're giving them what they need and giving them the best advice to our knowledge yeah. that we can give them but the advice we're going to give them should be based on their questions and what they want rather than what we think they want. 100%. So I love that point you made. Yeah, no, definitely. Don't know about the mould part, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, mould was really a bad example on that. I mean, I mean, I should kidding, say, yeah. yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. But it's, it is, it's a lot less regulated in the UK with that kind of situation because we don't have licenses. Yeah. And I like this. Yeah, it. but I like disclosure. I yeah. think we should absolutely disclose everything. Honestly, and I think, possible. yeah, absolutely. Transparency, honesty. Why not? Yeah. You know, why should we be hiding anything? Yeah. I don't believe that. You know, I, I, I think everything should be dis disclosed and, and, and just, you know, presented correctly. That, yeah. That's my opinion. I have a strong belief on that. No, I can I completely agree because that is the long term. There's a huge amount of people, I think, who think, oh, I want the paycheck and I'm going to just lie as you're much as You're going to get the paycheck yeah. and you're going to get it the right way. Yeah. And you're going to get paychecks for longer if you're honest. In it. Long term vision versus, oh, I just want to do my short term reward right now. Yeah. And, and not just from a selfish perspective. It's kind of nice to do right by someone as well. You Definitely. know what I mean? So you get a good night's sleep at the end of the day because actually you don't feel like you're like actually trying to sleep. Well, you know, you've done right. And, and, and I think, you know, we have a choice 
in life in general to yeah. do the right thing or the wrong thing by people. And I think that I don't think it's right to you know try and you know pull a fast one on anyone yeah. because a it's going to come back on you and b it's just it's not right yeah. and it doesn't it doesn't need to be done definitely in my opinion yeah that's definitely. my opinion hundred percent so um, actually I really heard something the other day that actually apparently in the UK now you can get a zero percent mortgage no way yeah they've just released another Let's go plan. back to the UK then <laughs> that is what my question is going to be do you think that we are going to go down that path again even though it, I mean it was eleven who's lending, years ago who's lending at zero percent that's a good question actually I need to look into that yeah and, and if anyone's out there I probably wouldn't recommend getting a zero percent mortgage with a ridiculous interest rate because you're going to find yourself in a bit of trouble but similarly do you think we're going to kind of are you seeing the mortgage zero, you mean 100% mortgage yes oh I zero see you're down payment oh okay fine so they'll lend 100% on the property which yeah. is kind of the early stage yeah. of what we saw in 2008 that over leverage is, is pretty dangerous yeah. and, and you're exactly right you know that's not what you want to see do you think that we're going to kind of go that way again because it does seem that the lending laws are being relaxed in some way lending laws have been relaxed and I think look we're in a capitalist society and the, at the end of the day yes it's relatively regulated but the truth is that the banks will always win. Yeah. The banks need to make money. The banks make money by making loans. The more loans the banks make, the more money they make. So ultimately, it kind of makes sense that they're going to become more aggressive on the lending again, and they probably already have started to. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's anywhere near what it was, but let's just hope it doesn't get to that point again, that because cool. then it's a false market we're in. Yeah. I think the market we're in right now is a real market, just just to be clear, yeah. because there's a lot of all cash, there is a lot of good loans and low leverage, but you know, if it did get to that, it would be a little bit worrying. Do you think then that we're actually going to see a steady increase in rates in terms of the mortgage over the next couple of years? Yeah, of I think it really depends on the stock market as well, but I think that you know, borrowing rates versus interest rates are you know, different. There's always a margin factored in. So you know, interest rates can go up and borrowing rates can still go down, depending yeah. typically on the stock market. From what I've seen anyway, I could be wrong, but from what I've seen... Um, so I think borrowing rates are actually quite low right now. Yeah. They're actually very attractive. So I think it's a good time to buy yeah. because you could probably get a good deal and you can borrow cheap. So I think it's I think it's a good if you can afford to and you are looking to buy. I think I, if I was a buyer, I'd probably buy now. Yeah, because yeah. actually we've kind of had this kind of sellers market over the last couple of years where yeah. multiple bids on a huge amount of the properties yeah. are priced correctly. Yeah. I, I felt a little bit of a slowdown in that, but not in kind of like, oh my God, we're going straight to a buyer's market. It just feels like it's kind of just leveled out quite well. Yes, yes it has. Do you think that's going to be the case for the next couple of years? Or what, I mean, obviously we're not Nostradamus that I was like yeah, say Yeah, I was going to say, I don't have a crystal ball yeah. with, but I wish I did. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's just that the market's leveled off a bit yeah. and it has shifted a little bit more towards being a buyer's market, but I don't think it's it's a major correction or a crash. I think it's just, you know shifted slightly from a buyer's to a seller's uh, from a seller's to a buyer's market but i think that the value in los angeles is there yeah. i think it's great value but i also think it's very subjective as well yeah there's a lot of not so great houses that have been asking crazy money because they think they can comp it against something great that's been built yeah and i think that's just kind of leveling off a little bit but i think that if it's a great house and it's well located yeah and it has the right aspect and the right floor plan and the right, you know, lifestyle. It's gonna sell. It's gonna sell. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I've seen price per square foot records being broken in West Hollywood with new constructions in the last month. Really? Yeah. So that's actually, yeah, that's a very good sign because that's, I get that constantly from a lot of our buyer clients who are like, oh, you know, I'm looking to buy, but actually, I'm hearing the market softening a bit. Maybe I should hold off for six months. And I'm like, it's just not a good idea. Generally, I, I yeah. would say just learn the market, get aware of it, because actually. Yes, in six months, it could be a better situation. It could be worse. Who knows? Yeah. And actually, you could have missed out on the property that you really liked and have to kind of... And if you're buying long term, I mean, if I'm buying a house to live in for the next yeah. 10, even 20, 30 years, who knows, right? Yeah. You know, I'd rather buy the... Like you said, I'd rather buy the property that I love yeah. than save a couple of hundred thousand and buy a property that I don't really love. Because I know it sounds like a lot of money now, but for... 10, 20, 30 years of lifestyle, I'd rather live in the right house. Do you know what I mean? And that's going to become immaterial over the long term anyway, that price differentiation. So I think it's like, you know, I think honestly, I, I would rather, like you said, buy what I like now, even if it costs a little bit more, yeah. if it's the right house. If it's, yeah. Over the long term. Right? Like, we do lose that a little bit in our heads, I think, because I had a comedian say that the other day when someone turned around and went, oh, you know, oh, if I buy my house today, that's great, but what happens if it loses 5% in value over the next 12 months? It's going to gain that 5% and probably many more 5% yeah. over the next 10 years. I don't know, I think the, the comedian's response was, I suppose you'll just have to live in it. 
Like, that's the reason you're actually buying the house, you know what I mean? Brilliant, it's brilliant like, response. I mean, that's yeah. it in a nutshell. Right? We're so used to that. It's like, okay, you're buying an appreciating asset, yeah. even though it's something that actually is getting older, mm-hmm. it's not as up with the times as it necessarily was, but we have this mindset where, you know what, you're buying something, it's got to be worth more in the future, and we don't really factor in the fact that you're going to have a good life living in a beautiful home. Yeah, In absolutely. a location that you really actually enjoy. Absolutely. Okay, what about this, David? Because I've, we've seen, obviously, I think, in the press, and obviously I think you get a bit more of an insider's knowledge of this, but we've seen some pretty big high price sales. I know we saw a £95 million one in London yeah. by Ken Griffin. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I think two days later, he bought £238 million in New York. In New York. Right? Yeah. Um, is this a sign that actually they're predicting the guys in the know that the market is going to go down and they're trying to put their money into these big trophy properties? Or I mean, we've seen a trend of that for sure yeah. over the last few years. I mean, if we're talking about one specific client who bought two big properties at once, you know, it's difficult to say because it may be very, you know, personalised reasons. Person. Yeah. yeah. If it was like multiple buyers, then I'd probably think, okay, you know, we're onto something here. But I think, you know, back to the point is that I do believe that if a property is very, very well positioned, well located, well built, yeah. at whatever price point, someone will come along and appreciate that and it will sell. Okay. You know, I maintain that. And we've sold a lot of those. Yeah. And, you know, there are only so many great properties. Yeah. And a lot of them have sold already, so it's becoming a little bit more difficult, right? But, you know, when I mentioned to you our listing portfolio right now, a lot of it's under construction. Yeah. You know, a lot of them we've advised and guided through the process of the construction and the build. And I feel that, you know, some of the new bigger houses we're going to see coming up over the next few years are going to be extraordinary. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And you don't think that there's going to be, because I constantly get that. I'm driving around the, the roads of Bel Air and Beverly Hills and West Hollywood and up in the hills especially. And it's just nonstop construction trucks everywhere. Nonstop construction. I mean, there's so much going on. Yeah. But I feel that a lot of it is, is going to be inferior. Okay. You know? do, but do you think that's... Because it does seem that they're, all of those properties that they're building are kind of in glass boxy modern or wow or those kinds of vibes generally yes do you think there's going to be a saturation in the market of like properties that are kind of very similar like that i think there already is a saturation i think that's been you know an issue in 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 the last year or so yeah you know the modern white box all the same yeah i think it's important to you know if someone's building to differentiate themselves by warming it up doesn't need to be a white box anymore. Make you know? it uh, individual. In yeah, time. you know, put up you know the the wood slats on the on the ceilings, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, put up the wallpapers. Um, you know, put up use use warmer stones and materials. Um, you know, put in a a warmer color kitchen. It doesn't have to be white, for example. Yeah. So I think you know these things are important so that the houses don't all look and feel the same. Yeah, character. Yeah, it's not just like they call it a sugar cube. You know yeah. what I mean. So I think, you know, I think it's important. And I think, I think actually developers are catching on to that now. So I think we're seeing a trend of, of more of that style, warmer style, as opposed to the, to the white boxes. But, you know, some of the white boxes are great. Yeah. But it's just if they're all very similar, then it's not that great. And especially if it's just drywall up, you know what I mean? And, and glass and that's it. They, yeah. they need to actually spend some money on, on the closets and the kitchen and, you know, all the finishes. Did you ever have that? Because when I first moved out here from selling property in London, obviously we have a huge amount of like Victorian streets and they're all brick built and they're 100 yeah. years old. And yeah. You can't change them and there's a lot of character driving down some of the roads. Obviously here I really like it because you have a lot more say in what you're going to do and you kind of have your land. But I always get that weird and I still have issues shaking it where I just see the plyboard walls going up and obviously mm. we're in an earthquake zone and it's <laughs> yeah. not be... But... Did you have that issue? Because I'm kind of like, when someone's spending, you know, $15 million plus on a home, mm-hmm. I feel like the wall should be built of something. <laughs> is, you know. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I mean, you can build concrete here. Yeah. You can, and some people do. Um, I don't think it's necessary in LA to yeah. build with concrete. Actually, you know, you can do some poured in place concrete accents, you know what I mean? And some walls like that. But I mean, ultimately, we are in an earthquake zone and I would feel that that's probably the reason that you know we use wood yeah because it actually moves with yeah and i think it's okay i think it's it, it lasts it stands the test of time and except for the last two weeks when we've had non-stop rain and oh my god like, oh, yeah no. that's true that has true there's that, been a few leaks here and there but oh, i can imagine that yeah because i i literally i suppose it, yeah it's just a weird thing in my head coming from where we do which is like a cup two thousand year old city yeah is you drive in and you see that stucco but my stucco is 
you know, what we see in the Georgian properties in the centre of London. Yes. As opposed to... I know what you're saying. Here, They're like, the yeah, the stuff of Reese Blocks with all the, you know, painted on top. Those Georgian properties are beautiful. I mean, London does have some of the best architecture in the world. It does. But it's then, a lot older. It's been around for long. It's also got some of the worst. You know what I mean? Like, where the bombings yeah, happened and you've true, got, yeah. like, that juxtaposition between concrete cheap poured thing yeah. from the 50s, yes, 60s. Yes, that's true. Next to something. and You're absolutely right. I mean, I think because you grow up in it, you think that's normal, and then once you move to another city, now LA's home, yeah. you actually kind of see that. No, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I can agree more. So do you guys ever sell properties in other cities as well? Because I know in, in America, referral business is quite a big thing. Like yeah. we've, we've referred properties that were sold in Florida, New York, mm. like areas like that. Yeah, we've done deals in London, New York, and absolutely, in, you know, not even in, the, in in LA, so to speak, you know, into Palm Springs, and, yeah. you know, around. We absolutely do that a lot, and we have a great network of trusted people that we work with. Yeah. So I think it's important. Do you think that grows? I've got a prediction that actually as we become more, you can work remotely, you can do everything, your network and who you know as all of the processes become more and more automated with technology. Yes. That, I think, is going to be a massive... It comes a lot easier, doesn't it? Well, it does, yeah. <laughs> Hi, meet this person, shake the hand, thank you, I'll take 25%. Yeah, it's great. That is a... But I think, you know, when we refer something out to any other agent, yeah. it's somebody that we know and we trust okay. and that is going to represent correctly because we won't just palm, you know, a referral off to anyone. Because I suppose it reflects on you. Absolutely, you know, the client's trusting us. Ideally, they want us to represent them. We can't, yeah. obviously, because it's not our area. We wouldn't be able to give them the service and attention they need. So the next best thing is for us to really go or recommend someone and refer it to someone we know and trust. Okay. I wouldn't, I would not give a referral to just anyone in a million years. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose actually at that, at the level you're kind of selling a lot of properties at, those people probably value that level of service. Yes. Way higher than someone Yeah. And I think, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's important, you know, our reputation is everything. You know, yeah. our name is, is pretty much the most important thing in this business. Yeah. And it's, for me, it's very important to maintain that my name is honest, ethical, and, and provides the level of service yeah. that I feel that my clients want. Okay. Whether I'm working with them or if I refer them to someone else, I want to know that they're still getting that level of service. And there's so many great realtors out there Definitely. that I work with and that I would always refer business to in, in other cities around the world. Yeah. So actually, yeah, over the next... So do, is that what you see yourself as doing? Let's fast forward five years, ten years, <laughs> and, you know... Yeah. I, you just want future. to be a real estate agent forever or kind of is, is that was that your vision when you were a kid as well were you thinking you know what I want to be that person that sells property presumably because you went into investments yeah I mean I, I, I've always loved real estate I, I, as I said I didn't feel like I was a natural salesman but I seem to have found my kind of groove oh, so to speak yeah um I would like to do this. I mean, I enjoy it. Yeah. You know, who doesn't want to walk around these crazy houses and sell insane real estate? Do you know what I mean? And, and, and work with, you know, everyone from, you know, really nice families to, you know, gurus and, and you know, billionaires and celebrities. And yeah. It's a great life, you know, 100%. and you meet so many people. Yeah. So, yes, one can start businesses up and do some development or, you know, set up any company because... The beauty, but still do real estate agency as they're called. But the beauty is, you're exposed to meeting so many people. You have so many contacts. There's someone to call for everything. You know what yeah, I mean? And I find that really useful. Okay. So you would always see yourself having a hand in real estate, even if you have some side hustles. I work too hard to build this up. You know, yeah. we've worked way too hard to build this up. I wouldn't let it go. I want to. I want to build on it and build on it. Would you, how do you think about that with kind of teams and building that? Because we see a lot of agents in here that have been in the industry for 30, 40 years obviously do an incredible amount of business and they kind of seem that they get to a certain age and they're like, look, I don't want to be necessarily doing the prospecting or the following up on leads and that kind of thing. So I'm going to have a couple of people in my team that are going to kind of do that side for me. And then they kind of take a position, almost like Mauricio, I think, at the agency eventually where it's an oversight and also helping out with a huge amount of the big listings. Right. No, I mean, he is, a, he is very much a realtor in his own right, yeah. Mauricio, but at the same time, you know, uh, he... he he does a lot of co-listings and you know he gives a lot of leads out but i think i think in answer to your question i can just speak from our experience we have a very close-knit team we have a very small team we don't have a team of you know 60 people but we still sell 550 million dollars of real estate in a year Definitely. and it, we've proven that we can do it just with you know the two of us and two assistants and a buyer's agent yeah that's it and and, and i i feel that you know to scale up too fast and grow our team too quickly will be almost compromising our name. Yeah. You know? 
I'd rather have it lean and mean, and we function very, very well yeah. as we do. So if it ain't broke, don't fix there it. you go. That's the way I look at it. No, I think you're right because I think uh, we see some guys actually, like Aaron Kerman in our office. Who and I'm not saying, listen, there's there's great teams out there. Yeah, there are great teams. I'm just saying from our perspective, from our experience, this is what's worked for us. So don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm there are great teams out there. No, and I think you're right because actually, the, you do it the way you do it best. Yeah, and then you kind of react to that. And there's some people who are incredibly good at managing a hundred people. Yeah, but maybe you know. There's more advantage, especially I think sometimes in the people that we deal with, is keeping that a lot more focused and actually having a knowledge of what everyone's doing and advising that, as opposed to this is what we're going to do, everyone go out and do it, and then finding out that things are just firefighting issues. I think can yeah. lead from those bigger teams. Yeah. Okay, so let's round it up. Actually, uh, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, yeah. I want to leave you, leave our listeners with just one last piece of of uh, value if you were right now an 18 year old coming out of school or you're coming out of college and you're thinking you know what i want to be a real estate agent if i if i'm sitting here in 10 years i want to be where david is what would be your piece of advice in terms of getting started in the business is there one core thing that you think that person because we, we've discussed quite a lot of it already so it may just be reiterating what we've already said but is there anything where you would be like look this is what I would do if I was fast forwarded back and I'm now 18 coming out of school. Yeah, get your license first, yeah. if you're in LA, that is. <laughs> um, May need that. Yeah, find a mentor. Okay. You know, someone you look up to. Yeah. That whether you're working as an intern, just to get the experience and see how they operate. Yeah. And offer to sit open houses. You will get so many leads. You can build your business by sitting other people's open houses. Yeah. Come on. Like you're sitting there, you're seeing direct clients, you're seeing, you know, buyers, you're, you're going to meet sellers, you're going to meet neighbors that might sell one day. Yeah. You're just going to grow that contact list and you're going to follow up on it and you're going to build your business that way. That's how I would do it. I love that. A bit of door knocking doesn't do any harm either. Door but... knocking doesn't do any harm. Because actually, yeah, I'm actually sitting someone else's open house this weekend, actually. You know, we've got a couple of leases right now. I, yeah, I am a big believer in that because face to face, I think, is actually the key. Absolutely. Yeah, and actually that's why we do these podcasts and we talk to people because it is almost that gateway drug to someone seeing your face, getting to know you yes. and really, like, I love it now and I suppose you must have a very extreme version of it where people walk up to you and they're like, hi David, like I've done actually, because <laughs> actually they feel like they know you, they've seen you on TV mm -hmm. and actually it's kind of like... Well, I'm not Brad Pitt, let's just, say <laughs> let's just get some perspective yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right, okay. Um, but no, I mean, it's... Yeah. it's I, I, I think it's, we, we live in a great environment. We work in a great environment. It's a great community. Yeah. Everyone, you know, I, I like to have great relationships with other agents because I love to do deals with yeah. them. And it's, it's always nice to have that agent that you've got a good relationship with on the other side of the transaction because it just makes everything so much smoother and more pleasant. So, you know, I, for, from an agent to agent perspective, I think that's probably one of the most important relationships. Yeah, definitely. Okay, then, so thank you so much. If thank people you are out there watching, obviously they can see you on TV, but if they want to come and follow you, tune into your story, yeah. where should they go on Instagram, I presume? Yeah, yeah, Instagram, uh, at David Bond Street. Bond Street. Bond ST. Bond ST. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm actually uploading some videos um, periodically about just my experience, just some advice, answering questions and uh, sharing my experiences. And it's become quite useful for yeah. me to learn from other people from their experiences and also to answer any questions they may have. Definitely. And actually, we may have some collaborations in the future, guys. We're actually, we're going to go and hopefully may. have some. May. We will have some collaborations. <laughs> I don't want to commit you to this on the, on the record. Don't worry. It's all but, good. I yeah. enjoy working with you. Ed. Yeah, exactly. So we will hopefully get some more content with Dave. We'll go and see some of the stuff that they're working on because I let, definitely look up to these guys at Bond Street Partners. And if you guys have any questions at all that you want us to put across to David as well, reach out to us. As you obviously know, because you're listening, Hutch Johnston is kind of our main account. Uh, email me at any time, Edward at Hutchinson Johnston, uh, and I will try and get any questions across to David as we possibly can and get you guys some answers. But I uh, hope you guys have a great day wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Thank you so much, David, again for, Thank you, for joining us. Thank and, you so uh, much. Let us know what we should do next time, how we should make this better, and how we should build this community. All right, thanks, guys. Goodbye. Rock and roll.